It is time to begin our worship services this evening. We want to welcome each and every one of you, and we thank you for being with us, and glad that you chose to worship with us here at Bobby Branch Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a warm welcome to you as well, and we encourage if you would, please fill out one of the visitor's cards located on the back of the pew. Once you've completed that, if you'll leave that on the pew, those will be collected following services. I want to remind all of us that we meet here at Bobby Branch at 9 a.m. each Sunday for a period of worship. We also uh, have a Bible study at 1015 and also Wednesday evening service, a Bible study service at 7 p.m. If you are here and you're visiting and you're in search of a home congregation, we encourage you to stay with us after services, get to know some of the members, certainly meet with our elders and learn more about what our congregation is doing to spread the gospel as well as edify ourselves in God's word. We also want to welcome those who may be viewing us on Facebook Live or perhaps those on the recorded version of YouTube or on Ben Loman Channel 6. We're glad that you've tuned in to watch our services this evening. We'll remind you as well, if you're in our immediate area, we encourage you to be with us as we meet here in person at the building. Before we begin our services this evening, I do have a few announcements. Uh, those that we know of that are sick and continue at home is Brown Woodley. David Cathy, this is Don and Martha's son, Teresa Gann, Morris Griffith, uh, Chester Sullivan, this is Chancey Woodside's father. will be next uh, Sunday evening, May 22nd. And just prior to that, there will be a vacation planning meeting. Again, both of these next Sunday evening following services. There are a couple of gospel meetings, uh, one at Midway in Cannon County and Mount View in Coffee County. Both of those begin today. There's also a Smart Station, I'm sorry, a Vacation Bible School at Smart Station will be uh, next uh, Saturday from 9 to 11 a.m. Visitation Group 3, don't forget your meeting in Room 1 following services this evening. At this time, if you would please stand, our first song will be number 699, number 699. To the harvest fields I will gladly go.
Please be seated and turn to 242 if you're using the book, 242. Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you for this good day that you've blessed us with this first day of the week that we've been able to assemble here. We thank you for this privilege that you've granted us, this opportunity to come to this place to learn more of thy word, to give praise to thy name. We just pray that everything that's done here tonight will be in complete harmony with thy will. And Father, we pray that freedom such as this together in thy name would always abound in this nation in our lives and that we would never take it for granted but we would always take advantage of this opportunity to assemble with like-minded christians and father at this time we pray for our nation that our freedoms would continue in this land you've blessed us so much so richly but in many ways it seems as though we've turned our backs upon you and we've allowed sin to be called good at this time in our lives and it seemingly doesn't affect us anymore in this land we just let it be we just pray that we would turn from those things that are sinful and have the courage to call them out and to stand for what is right we just pray that you you would have your mercy upon us and that you would guide us and we would get back to where you would want us to be as a nation and father we pray for our elected officials that as they govern they would look to the bible they would look for knowledge and, and look to you for guidance that as they govern and set laws before us that they would never set laws that would infringe upon the rights that you've granted us father we thank you that you've allowed each of us to gather here tonight you provide us provided for us the safety and the health that we might assemble here in person we thank you we ask that these blessings might always continue but 
We are mindful of those of our number who are not able to be with us for whatever reason, sickness and other ailments and, and things that are keeping them from being part of this in service, that this service in person. We just pray that your blessings would be upon them and you would help them to recover and regain a, a better portion of health so that they too can be back with us soon, if it be thy will. Father, we thank you for this congregation that meets here at Bobby Branch. We thank you for every member. We just pray that we might always work together, striving to do thy will in unity, and that we would be here to lift one another up, that we would work to help spread and grow thy kingdom, and that every effort that is made here, that, that you would bless it. And may Bobby Branch always be seen as a light upon a hill in this community. We just pray, Father, that you'd go with us now. That you would go with us always. You would guide our lives. You would watch over us, keep us safe. And for those times that we fall short of what you would want us to do, we ask that you would forgive us as we might also forgive those who trespass against us. So I ask now that as we go further into this service, that you would help us to have open hearts and minds, that we would take the lesson of the hour and see how we might let it sink into our hearts and we could apply it to our everyday walks of life so that we might be better Christians because of it. Just pray that you always be with us. We would always give you the honor and glory for everything. We know that you bless us so much in this life. As we come to the end of this prayer, we, we praise you for everything. But most of all, we thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we ask this prayer. Amen. Invitation song is number 674. There's a great day coming, 674. And now let us sing number 340. 340. <clears throat>
Tonight's reading is taken from Malachi 2, 16. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Good to see each of you here tonight, and uh, normally on the first Sunday evenings of each month, I address questions and answers. After last month, I said, if you have a question you'd like to ask it, please hand one to me. And at that time, I was handed probably eight or nine questions, and obviously, I'm not going to be able to deal with all those right away. And uh, beginning the 1st of June, we start our summer series uh, this year is going to be on the book of Ecclesiastes. Our first speaker will be Brother John DeBerry. He called last night and said he's looking forward to being here. He is uh, going to do a wonderful job of introducing the subject of Ecclesiastes. But what that does mean that I will not be able to have the months of June and July. And so I thought for the month of May, I would try to catch up on some of the questions that have been submitted. Several questions have been submitted on the topic of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And I will tell you that some relate to some specific passages and others are with regard to some specific teachings. Now, I realize that this is an emotional issue. I dare say that in this assembly tonight, there's not one family that has not been touched in some way by the topic of divorce. I do t want you to know that I understand the Old Testament and how difficult situations must have been. For instance, in the book of Ezra, chapter 10, if you look at verse 11, it says, Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will, and listen carefully, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the pagan wives. You get to verse 44, and it says, All of these had taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. You can't tell me that that's not a very emotional issue, that it required the separation of some families where children were involved. That had to be incredibly difficult. But if you go back to the second verse of that chapter, it says, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land, yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. There's always hope that a person will do what God says to do, live how God says to live, and they can live acceptably. That doesn't always mean they can be married. It doesn't always mean that they can continue in a situation that they're not allowed to continue in. Now, someone says, well, the positions that you may advocate are very strict. And I would suggest to you that when Jesus presented his teaching on the topic of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, that the disciples also saw it as being very strict. In Matthew 19 and verse 10, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry if this teaching is going to be so strict, maybe we ought not even get married at all. And the Lord said it was for those whom could accept it. In John 6, in a little bit different context, it says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that the disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? I will tell you tonight that what I am going to do is attempt to answer the questions that have been asked from God's Word. And if it does produce offense, the offense comes from what the Lord answered, what His Word says, not necessarily from me. I'm simply trying to present what I believe the Bible teaches on this topic. Okay, first question. Please explain 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 10 through 24. I'm going to put it on the screen, but I really believe it would be valuable for you if you took your copy of the Bible and opened it up, and let's read through this section 
And then we're going to come back and notice a few of the details. Now to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if a, any brother has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? But God has distributed to each one as the Lord has called each one. So let us walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Now, uh, verses 21 through 24, Will you call while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called as the Lord's, while, uh, is, while a slave is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price, therefore do not become the slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. Now, let me step back and point out you have to look at the context in order to appreciate this passage. If you go all the way back up to the very first verse of that context, the passage was introduced by questions asked by the Corinthian congregation. Paul wrote, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. The church there had written Paul and wanted to know some things. That was question and answer night for Paul. His first statement is, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. The word touch there carries with it the intimate relationship. And so it's good for a man not to have relations with a woman. He goes on to explain that fornication is unacceptable to God. In verse 2, he says, Nevertheless, because of fornication, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. God wanted to prevent fornication. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. He didn't want fornication to take place among them. Now, he advised the congregation not to marry. Now, the reason of that was because of the present distress in verse 26. Look with me at verses 7 and 8 and then verse 26. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the married and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. At that time, Paul was single. He said, I want them to remain like I am. But you have to understand why he said that. You go down to verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that it is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as it is. There was some sort of persecution that was afflicting the church at Corinth. And Paul was recommending. Now, he did not bind their not getting married. But what he did was recommend that it would not be wise to do so under those conditions. But drawing specifically to the question of verses 10 and following, the Lord himself had taught that it was not right to divorce. Look with me again at verses 10 and 11. Now to the married I command, 
Yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Now notice carefully, he says, I command, but he says, yet not I, but the Lord. This teaching is found in Matthew chapter 19, beginning with verse 3, going through verse 9. We're going to look at that passage in a few moments. But that's where the Lord taught on this, that a man is not to divorce his wife, a wife is not to divorce her husband, and that was the basic law. Same thing found in Matthew 5, 31 and 32 as well. So that was the basic principle, and Paul is reiterating that, saying this is what Christ taught. But then when you get to verses 12 through 16, he says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. Now, Paul is not contradicting. He is not, as one man said, countermanding what the Lord says. He is addressing a specific situation about which they ask. What is it if a Christian is married to a non-Christian? How is the Christian supposed to act in those situations? He says, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to leave with him, you notice how he phrases it, let him not divorce her. In the opposite way, he says, a woman who has a husband who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce, let uh, her, him not divorce her. The principle is no divorce. The Lord did not want divorce. As David read just a few moments ago, Malachi 2, verse 16, for I, the Lord, hate divorce. God doesn't like it, and his law is to inhibit it and prohibit it as much as possible. But he stresses here to remain in the calling with which one is called. Look with me at verses 17, 20, and 24. Verse 17, he says, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Look at verse 20, let each one remain in the calling in which he was called. Look at verse 24, brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Now, I've heard some people say that if you've been married and divorced, two, three, four times, and then all of a sudden you become a Christian, then you stay in that state in which you were called. That's not what he's saying at all, brethren. Because if you go back and you look specifically at the context, he talks about things which like are circumcision and uncircumcision, and he said they're nothing. He's talking about things that are neither right nor wrong. For instance, being circumcised or uncircumcised is neither right nor wrong. Being a free or being a slave is neither right nor wrong. But he's not talking about an unscriptural marriage here. Because what he says, what matters is keeping the commandments of God. And I'd ask the question, could you remain as a thief? If I was called as a thief, here I am, I become a Christian. Can I continue to steal and... Uh, be acceptable to God? What about a man who's a polygamist, who's married to more than one woman, and here he comes along, he says, I want to become a Christian. Can he keep all of his wives? What about a man who's living with someone, and he's a fornicator? Can he continue to live in his fornication and be acceptable to God? Well, listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I don't think that needs a whole lot of explanation. He's made that pretty plain. But he follows that with verse 11, and such were some of you. That's who you were. That's not who you are now. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, in becoming a Christian, there is this act of repentance. And repentance means that I repent of the things that I have done wrong, whether it's being a thief, whether it's being a polygamist, or whether it's being an adulterer. 
Listen to Ezekiel 33, verses 14 through 16. And when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, and listen carefully now, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and shall surely live. That's pretty plain, folks, that you've got to make a change. So if I'm looking at 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 24, I see the teaching of the Lord there, and I see the, the application of Paul to a specific situation, and that revolves around our doing what God has said to do. Question number two. Is it permissible for the guilty party to remarry? Now, uh, in order to explain this, I have to uh, explain the idea behind that. We know that in the Bible, we're going to look at Matthew 19 and here in just a moment, but you have an innocent party who's been sinned against and you have a guilty party who committed the sin. And the violation of those marriage bonds by being joined to another person. And it has been suggested that what you have is a handcuffed argument. If you will, just imagine here, you've got a man to my right and you've got a woman to my left and the two of them are married. And the idea is those two being joined together like being joined with a handcuff. And I've heard people say that what you do when you release the innocent person, you also release the guilty person as well. But what they forget is, is that both the innocent and the guilty are still obligated to God to do what God says to do. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 20, or 18 through 22, he talks about our being slaves of God. And if I'm a slave, like I talked about in our lesson this morning, then I have that obligation to do what God says to do in any particular situation in which I find myself. The Lord granted permission, if you will. He gave authority for the one party to remarry, and that's the one who was the innocent party who was sinned against by the cause of fornication. Let's go to Matthew 19. Let's begin with verse 3, and let's go through verse 9. And again, I encourage you to take your Bibles. Let's go through this. You may find some other places you want us to further discuss. Verse 3 says, The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. So then there are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Now here's the key part. And I say unto you, whoever divorces his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever more marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now, I don't know how the Lord could have put it any plainer than he did. Here are people asking him a question. They're testing him. They're trying him. And the Lord's answer is so particular, so to the point that he says, the person who puts away that fornicating spouse has his permission to marry again. Nobody else does. The guilty party doesn't. Someone who decides they just want a divorce for any other reason. No, the only, there's one and only one cause that the Lord gives here, and that is for the cause of fornication. 
The guilty party is not only prohibited from marrying again, but anybody who would want to marry that person is prohibited as well because he said the person who marries that person who's put away commits adultery. You see, in the Lord's eyes, that was to be, that person was never to be able to marry again. And you say, well, that's, that's tough. Well, sometimes there are consequences to a person's sins. And such is the case here. Now, given this position, if a person says a guilty right party has a right to remarry, then they would have divorce for just any cause or any reason. Those who say this are clearly contradicting what Jesus said. Because if the guilty party can marry again acceptably to God, then is not it just divorce for any reason whatsoever? Now, there's some who hold this view who say that, well, the word adultery just describes the breaking of a covenant. And it does not describe a physical act. Let me take you to John 8 and verse 4. They said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. I don't have to guess what the Lord was being presented with there. Here's a woman who was married or the person she was with was married and she was committing adultery which is a form of fornication when i go to passages like colossians chapter 3 verses 5 through 7 and he talks about fornication and all these sinful patterns of life he says in the latter part of verse 7 which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them that was a pattern of life which you followed Romans 7 and verse 3, so then, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she shall be or will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law of that husband, though she is a, no adulteress, though she is married another man. I don't think that you have to go too far to realize that God's law was pretty specific, that one and only one person had that right to divorce and remarry and it's a person who had been sinned against question number three are non-christians bound by the law of christ before they become christians let me ask that question again are non-christians bound by the law of christ before they become christians there was a debate took place in the 1950s. There was a preacher by the name of E.C. Fuqua who came up with a doctrine that says, well, that people before they become Christians are not subject to, he used the word amenable, to the law of Christ on marriage until they become Christians. In other words, while I'm out here in the world, I can do this, I can do that, and uh, but when I become a Christian, then it somehow sanctifies that position that I'm in, much like some would say from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If so, how did these people become sinners? Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered into the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How did you get to be a sinner? Listen to 1 John 3 and verse 4. I'm going to read the King James, which is at the bottom. Whoever transgress or committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. New King James said sin is lawlessness. It's living as if there is no law of God on the subject. Now, if I become a sinner when I transgress God's law, what law did man transgress in order to become a sinner? Listen to Romans 4, verse 15. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there's no transgression. Here's a man out here who's in the world. Is he a sinner? Romans 5, 12, is he a sinner? Well, absolutely he is. Well, how did he get to be a sinner? Well, he violated the law. What law did he violate? 
All men are under one law right now. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, what that does is, why would we apply that just to marriage? Why not to theft? In other words, if I go to Brother Stanley's and I decide I want to steal one of his motorcycles, I decide I've got to be in my bonnet and I want to ride a motorcycle and I go over to his house and I say, okay, I want to steal his motorcycle. And I come back and I say, okay, now I want to repent and be right. You know what Stanley's going to say? Give me my motorcycle back. It involves repentance. Why not extortion? And here's another. Why not kidnapping a child? Let's say, for instance, you go out and you want, a, you want a child real bad in your family and you kidnap someone else's child and you start trying to raise them as your own and you say, now I want to become a Christian. Can you keep that child? What about polygamy? Again, I try to bring these up to make a point that if we start saying that a man who is out in the world is not under the law of Christ, Pray tell, what law is he under? How does he violate the law to become a sinner? And if he's not under any law, then we better leave him alone because he's not got any sin at all. Are these questions serious? Absolutely. You know, some of you may think there's, this is, you know, a whole bunch of spending time about things that are not important. But let me point out to you, what if a person practices what you preach and you preach that the guilty party can marry? What if you preach it, you can get divorced and remarry for just any cause? What if you say, well, you can just stay in any state that you want to stay in? And then they get to the day of judgment and the Lord looks down and he said, you were an adulterer. I don't want anyone to stand before God in the day of judgment and say, well, that preacher knew about that, but he didn't tell me that. Because I don't want anybody's soul to be lost. Now, I know that people say, but God wants me to be happy. I can't tell you how many times I have heard people say, but God wants me to be happy. And I would say to them, yes, God does want you to be happy. But he wants you to be righteous. And he wants you to be happy eternally. Sometimes to be happy eternally means that I've got to go through some disappointments here in this life. The best illustration that I can give you is found in Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 26. You know it very well. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And here's why. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of, in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. You see, what Moses was so um, insightful about was he looked and he said, you know what? I can either go through a little difficulty here so I can have eternal bliss or I can have a little bliss here and be lost eternally. We don't want anybody to be lost. The song, there's a great day coming. That's the day in which the Lord will judge this world in righteousness. And you and I need to make sure that we're ready for that day. We need to make sure that if our lives do not conform to what he has taught us, that we change. That's what he's calling on us to change if you're not right. That change may require us to stop using bad language. It may require us to stop gossiping. It may require us to stop doing all sorts of bad things. But it also requires us to start doing some good things and to live a life of holiness. You want to become a Christian because of your faith in Christ? Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him. Be baptized. And then the Lord will forgive you of those sins. You live a holy life, and the Lord will promise you a home in heaven. If you're a Christian, you need to, to make things right. Why? Why? Wait. 
Why not be right with him tonight? Would you come as we stand and sing? There's a great day coming. the song be one verse of 160, 160. Oh. Well, once again, we want to thank each and every one of you for being with us here for our worship services this evening. If you are here with us this evening and you were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, the communion has been left prepared, and if you'll proceed to the door that is on my right, there will be men there will help you with partaking of the Lord's Supper and concluding the services for this evening. Tony, I want to thank you for another great lesson, something I know that touches all of us in our lives and our culture today, and certainly needed that to hear that message and to be able to echo and share that message as we leave these doors and leave this building as well. So, Leonard, once again, thank you for the song selection and leading us in, in those this evening. Don't forget, our Wednesday evening Bible study will be at 7 p.m., so we encourage all of you to be here and be with us at that time. Again, we'll have one closing song and a closing prayer. Down at the cross where my Savior died,
Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of the service, we pray, Father, that you go with us now to our homes, protect us and guide us, help us to look forward to our next meeting again. Guide us, Heavenly Father, and be with us as we depart. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.